I think most of you probably found the three chapters this week easier reading uh, than the three preceding chapters, at least I hope so, um, because they're much more straightforward and I think uh, uh, targeted than what went on before. But of course we're seeing a, a macro transition in the argument, which if you reflect back on where we've been, we started by looking simply at the exchange of commodities, commodity on commodity, kind of barter situation in which we imagined there was socially necessary labor time embodied in each commodity even though that was a pretty much impossible thing. So we went from a, a CC relation, a commodity to commodity relation, then to the argument that in order for exchange to become general you need some way in which uh, markets can function uh, and that required the emergence of the money form, so we went to the, the commodity exchange is mediated by money. And towards the end of the money chapter we suddenly got into this inversion where we started to look at a form of circulation which had this form, in which the objective uh, is different from the CMC, and as Marx puts it, in the CMC circuit you're perfectly happy about the fact that you're exchanging equivalents because you're exchanging different qualities of shirts and shoes and apples and oranges and all the rest of it, and you're perfectly happy with the idea that uh, you end up with the same value as you started out with because you're simply interested in the use value. When we get to this, however, as Marx points out, it's an absurd idea that you would actually take money and go through all of the risk and all of the problems of going through this circulation process to end up with the same amount at the end. So he kind of says the only way in which this circulation process makes sense is by adding in delta M, or as he's going to define it, the surplus value. And then that poses the big question, where does that surplus value come from when the laws of exchange are very explicit as they are laid out in classical political economy and all the rest of it, that in perfectly functioning markets you should have equivalence in exchange, that an equivalence here, an equivalence there, so where does the extra come from? And the answer is going to be that there's going to be a commodity which has the capacity to produce more value than it itself has, and that's labor power, so that's the answer if you like. So these three chapters are really about this transition where we're looking at what's going on in the market. So that's the story of these, uh, of this, of these three, the three chapters. But as usual with Marx there are some conundrums and some oddities and things that we need to sort of work out, and on the very first page of uh, this chapter which opens this uh, analysis on uh, the circulation of on, on the general laws, the general formula for capital, he poses an issue which I've actually raised a, a number of times already, but here I think it takes on uh, a more meaningful form and a form that needs to be, we need to reflect upon because I think it has considerable significance for how we understand uh, our current situation. In effect, what, he's, what he does on this first page is to point out that there is both a logical origin of capital, uh, but there is also a historic origin, and we have to pay attention to that historical origin. So he says, the circulation of commodities is the starting point of capital. Uh, the production of commodities and their circulation in its developed form, namely trade, form the historic presuppositions under which capital arises. So the historic presuppositions are important. World trade and the world market date from the 16th century and from then on the modern history of capital starts to unfold. So here he's talking then about the historic origins of capitalism, uh, and uh, of course, by mentioning the 16th century, taking up an argument that Wallerstein made a great deal of in his world systems uh, argument about the formation of the world market, 16th century onwards, that this is the origins of, of capital. 
And towards the bottom of this page he says, historically speaking capital invariably first confronts landed property in the form of money, in the form of monetary wealth, merchants' capital and usurers' capital. And we're going to find this question of the positionality of merchants' capital and usurers' capital, or as we would now call it finance capital, it's much more respectable of course to call it that, but finance capital, what's the, what's the role of them in relationship to uh, industrial capital? Uh, and then, then he makes the logical argument, however we do not need to look back at the history of capital's origins, Every day the same story is played out before our eyes, it, that, cap, that capital enters in the shape of money, money which has to be transformed into capital by definite processes. Now the immediate implication of this is that money is not necessarily capital. Capital is money used in a certain way. So not all money is capital. I can create capital by just simply taking the money in my pocket and using it in a certain way, launching it into this form of circulation. I can take capital out of circulation simply by saying, oh I'm not going to do that anymore, I'm going to take all this money and put it back in my pocket. So if you ask the question, what's the total amount of money in society and what's the total amount of capital in society, you're asking two fundamentally different questions. And you have to understand that capital is created by a social decision on the part of some people somewhere to use capital in this particular way. And it is that process of conversion of money into capital which Marx really wants to look at in these sections. Now the first distinction, he says, is really in their form of circulation. And he here goes back over some of the stuff he earlier did in the chapter on money, he kind of repeats some of this stuff about, well going from C to M and M to C are two different operations. Uh, in the same way, starting with M and going to M is a different kind of operation from this one. So, you know, and then he gets into uh, this notion immediately, as he says on the middle of 248, the circulatory process MCM would be absurd and empty if the intention were, by using this roundabout route, to exchange two equal sums of money, hundred pounds for a hundred pounds. But then there's something else in here which is very important, which is what is done with the money when it's received. As he says on 249, towards the bottom, two-thirds down, the money therefore is not spent, it is merely advanced. That is, the capitalist uses the money and departs with the money, but doesn't spend it in the ordinary sense on consumption, advances the money in such a way to get back that money plus, uh, plus, plus the, the profit, the surplus value. So the intent of the circulatory process is what really matters. The exchange of use values is one thing, and that is about satisfying a social need or, or a particular individual need or want or desire and so on, but then the other is this quantitatively different amount of value which you're seeking to acquire by this form of circulation, the MC M prime circulation. And that leads him to his definition, which is a very important definition on 251, which says, the process MCM does not therefore owe its content to any qualitative difference between its extremes, for they are both money, but solely to quantitative changes. This increment or excess over the original value I call surplus value, fundamental category in Marxian theory surplus value. And the big question he's going to pose, of course, is what is surplus value, where does it come from, what is it all about? Top of 252. He then elaborates on this a bit. The value originally advanced, therefore, not only remains intact while in circulation, but increases its magnitude, adds to itself a surplus value 
or is valorized. The valorization of capital is about the way in which the original intent to gain more money is realized at the end of this circulation process. And he then goes on to say, and this movement converts it into capital. Now, several times I've, I've made the kind of comment that Marx is always interested in processes rather than things. And if you ask yourself the question, well, what is capital? The answer is immediately, I think, foretold in this phrase, it's value in motion. It is a circulation process. It is value which is moving in such a way as to create more value. And that is the definition of capital, when he kind of says, and this movement converts it into capital. So it is the movement that does it. It's not a thing. It's not that I go and look at something and say, ah, that's capital. That's not what happens. As far as Marx is concerned, it's when something is put in motion. Only when it is put in motion is it capital, and when the motion ceases, it is not capital. So it is this process definition of capital which is fundamental to Marx's argument. And as I've already pointed out, we can, cre we can all of us go out and create an immense amount of capital tomorrow if we take all of our money in our pocket and start using it in this way. We could also get rid of a lot of capital tomorrow if we went around and took away all that money and, and said, OK, we're just going to spend it, not use, use it in this kind of way. But this then also creates another interesting element in the story, because on 253 he points out the following. The simple circulation of commodities, the appropriation of use values, the satisfaction of needs, etc. As against this, the circulation of money as capital is an end in itself. For the valorization of value takes place only within this constantly renewed movement the movement of capital is therefore limitless. Now you remember the chapter on money, when he talked about the way in which money is a form of social power. And as a form of social power it is potentially limitless. And therefore there are no limits on how much money and so that kind of social power you might accumulate, whereas there's a limit on the number of use values you can reasonably hold, the number of shoe, pairs of shoes, the numbers of Ferraris, the number of yachts, the number of houses, all those kinds of things, there's a limit. Whereas this is limitless. So this is a form of circulation then that tends always towards breaking limits, extending, expanding, growing, by definition, movement, it must move, it must expand. It must always be finding delta M, more delta M. Whereas in a society governed by simply exchange of use values, <coughs> we wouldn't have that imperative. Now I earlier on sort of posed this question in Marx's Capital, what is socially necessary? Well what we're seeing here is Marx immediately making the argument that what is socially necessary for the survival of capitalism is its constant expansion, its constant growth, and that it's striving towards limitless growth. It may not get there, it may encounter all kinds of limits, and it may crash, it may destroy the environment, it may destroy politics, it may do all kinds of horrible things, but capitalism as a system is socially necessarily connected to this drive for surplus value. Which leads him on 254 to define the role of the capitalist. Now again, remember, in capital we're dealing with roles, not individuals. I've said, we, you and I can become capitalists immediately. We can stop being capitalists. Some of us may, to some degree, already be mini-capitalists. I have a pension fund which actually invests in things, so in a sense I'm a bit of a capitalist. 
It's in the stock market, and the pension fund is, is in there. So, it is the role which we're going to look at, the role of the capitalist. And what Marx says is this, as the conscious bearer of this movement, the possessor of money becomes a capitalist. His person, or rather his pocket, is the point from which the money starts and to which it returns. The objective content of the circulation we have been discussing is his subjective purpose, and it is only in so far as the appropriation of ever more wealth in the abstract is the sole driving force behind his operations that he functions as a capitalist. That is, if you are a capitalist, you have to be seeking that expansion, seeking the surplus value, gaining the surplus value, creating a world around you in which that surplus value can be realized, in which your capital can be valorized. The implication of this is that use values must therefore never be treated as the immediate aim of the capitalist, nor must the profit of any single transaction. His aim is rather the unceasing movement of profit-making. This boundless drive for enrichment, this passionate chase after value, is common to the capitalist and the miser. But while the miser is merely a capitalist gone mad, the capitalist is a rational miser. The ceaseless augmentation of value which the miser seeks to attain by saving his money from circulation is achieved by the more acute capitalist by means of throwing his money again and again into circulation. The literary example of that, which I, which I always lo love, is, is uh, Balzac's novel Eugenie Grande, which almost certainly Marx had read. And the beginning of the novel has this miser, uh, Grande, with the, you know, all of the gold sort of hidden away in, in his house somewhere or other, and the end of the story is he puts all the gold in bags and he's riding into town in order to convert it into, into rent so that he can get a rate of return in the money market on, on it. And it's a kind of a, a story of the, of the rational you know, the, 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 the miser and the, and, and, and the capitalist and the conversion of the miser into, into the capitalist, and I, I often wonder if Marx had that story in mind when he just wrote this kind of brief uh, thing. Almost, you know, he, he read all of Balzac, so we know that, so almost certainly I, I suspect he had that in mind when he wrote this. Now this then leads to a further contemplation on 255-56 on the definition of capital. Because while capital is value in motion, it also takes on these physical forms. It, it is objectified in these physical forms, and it has to be objectified in physical forms. As he says, it is constantly changing from one form into another, without becoming lost in this movement. It thus becomes transformed into an automatic subject we reach the following elucidation. Capital is money, capital is commodities. That is, when we look at this form of circulation, we see capital here exists in money form, here it exists in commodity form, here it comes back into the money form. So in terms of its objectifications, it's in these forms. He then goes on, in truth, however, value is here the subject of a process in which, while constantly assuming the form in turn of money of commodities, it changes its own magnitude, throws off surplus value from itself, considered as original value, and thus valorizes itself independently. For the movement in the course of which it adds surplus value is its own movement. Its valorization is therefore self-valorization. By virtue of being value, it has acquired the occult ability to add value to itself it brings forth living offspring, or at least lays golden eggs. Now, two things about this. First, value is a subject. Here, value is here the subject of a process. Because the capitalist is a bearer 
of this quest for surplus value. And so Marx is kind of saying the capitalist doesn't have it necessarily any choice. If they're going to be a capitalist, this is what they have to do. And what that means is, instead of analyzing what individual capitalists do, we analyze the circulation of value in these terms, in order to understand what it is that capitalists do. What is it that drives them to do the things they do? The second thing about this passage is there's, there's heavy irony involved. When Marx talks about the way of being value, it has acquired the occult ability to add value to itself. It brings forth living offspring, or at least lays golden eggs. Now Marx often uses irony and often uses heavy jokes, and you have to be careful not to take the jokes as actually serious. Of course, he's talking about the world of appearance. It appears as if it's got occult, and much of capital is going to be about elucidating what goes on behind that apparent occult quality of laying golden eggs for itself. I once was invited to be an examiner on a doctoral thesis in philosophy that actually took this passage seriously, and talked about, and went on and on and on about Marx's occult theory of, of value creation. And I said something like, well, did you read the section on fetishism of commodities? Wouldn't you realize that actually what Marx is going to do here is set up the fetish concept in order to deconstruct it and demystify it? All of the students' advisors looked very embarrassed and said, what was that? But you know. So be careful sometimes reading Marx, not to take something like this which is, a, which is an irony and a joke, and treat it too seriously. A lot of problems arise out of that. So he's setting it up in this world of appearance. What does capital appear like? Now, you can see what the, uh, the occult quality comes from. If you have a savings account, you put it in a bank, and you put it in a savings account. At the end of the year you end up with interest. Golden eggs happened magically, right? You think it's natural. What well, Marx is kind of saying, yeah, we all <coughs> live in a world where actually it seems as if it's inevitable that our capital grows. So the point here is that indeed it does have that appearance of occult quality. And if we're simply content with that occult quality and, uh, and imagine it's just going to lay golden eggs. I mean, in a sense, what the argument was about the privatization of social security was we were invited, or you were invited, you know, it's a bit too late to invite me on this, but you were invited to put your money in somewhere and just wait for it to grow. And to actually believe in this occult quality that somehow or other this was going to be your golden nest egg. So what Marx is doing here is simply pointing out that actually we live in a world, and this was true of rentier incomes during Marx's uh, time, and which is the story of Eugenie Grande, that he's going, he's going to, he's not, he's going to work for it, he's going, to, he's going to get the golden eggs that come from investing in rents. So this then leads him to say the following, that out of these two forms, money, commodity, money, where do you know, or how, at what point in that process are you in a position to measure how much value you've got? The answer is in the money form. So there's a certain asymmetry in all of this. I don't know what the commodity is worth until I get it to market. Only when I get it to market do I know that I've got the money form, and only then do I know that I've got the surplus value. So he says, on 256, 
in simple circulation, and the circulation MCM, value suddenly presents itself as a self-moving substance which passes through a process, of its own, a process of its own, and for which commodities and money are both mere forms. And he then talks about the way this works. And earlier on he's made the kind of comment, there is no antagonism, as in the case of hoarding, between the money and commodities. And then he uses this expression, which I'm sure you, some of you wondered about, the capitalist knows that all commodities, however tattered they may look, or however badly they may smell, are in faith and in truth money, are by nature circumcised Jews, and what is more, a wonderful means for making still more money out of money. Further down, we come to the conclusion, value therefore now becomes value in process, money in process, and as such, capital. That is, money is the place where we start. Now, there are a number of things going on here which I think are important to look at. The passage about Jews, there is a debate that I'm sure if you want to get into you'll find no end of it, as to the degree to which Marx was anti-Semitic, and his comments on Jews are frequently of this nature. There are various ways in which you can read this, there are various explications as to how and why uh, he used this kind of language. Uh, of course, it was not uncommon language at that time. You only got to think of Dickens and Fagin and all the rest of it. So this was not uncommon. But then I think there's also one other way in which you can read this, and that is to say that what Marx is saying is that all those really nasty, horrible things that are said about the Jew, and had long been said about the Jew in Christian society, should in fact be said about the capitalist. That actually you should take all of that stigma and all that rhetoric which is directed at a particular ethnic group which is associated with money, and then actually transfer, transfer it onto that group which is really using the money that way, which is the capitalist class. You can take that or leave it, you know. I mean, go read the debate and the discussion. As I say, there's a lot of discussion on this topic. But we come back again and again in this chapter to the idea that capital is value in motion. It is a process. It is defined in that, to those terms. But it is a process which can only be measured and understood in terms of the money value. So the money form becomes, as it were, up front in the circulation process. He then comes back to a topic he briefly touched on, and he's going to touch on it in the next chapter two, which is to say, well, there are various ways in which MCM can occur. We get merchant's capital, we get interest-bearing capital, we get industrial capital. So we have to take into account all those different forms of circulation and recognize that they all fall under this general rubric of this MCM plus delta M form of circulation. Next chapter. He immediately Moses raises the problem of where can this surplus value possibly come from? On 260, 261, he starts to talk about the problems. Right at the bottom, 
First off, he talks about the vulgar economists have practically no inkling of the nature of value, hence whatever they wish to consider the phenomena in its purity after their, their fashion, they as assume that supply and demand are equal, that they cease to have any effect at all. Now I've several times mentioned to you this uh, argument that Marx is frequently introducing, which is that supply and demand conditions explain why prices and that and yo-yoing all over the place, but the equilibrium price is what we're going to be looking at. And even the capitalist theorists accepted that equality should be a condition of exchange. So on 261 he says, where equality exists there is no gain. It is true that commodities may be sold at prices which diverge from their values, but this divergence appears in an infringement of the laws governing the exchange of commodities. Now the laws are the laws of political economy as set up in the perfectly functioning competitive market world of Adam Smith and Ricardo. So he says, in its pure form the exchange of commodities is an exchange of equivalence, and thus it is not a method of increasing value. And he then goes on to say, well, one of the ways in which classical political economists, and he take, singles out Condillac, have, uh, has dealt with this, is by kind of immediately switching and saying, well, it must be something about use values. But Marx rebuts that and says, you know, our whole analysis says it can't be use values. And their analysis says it can't be use values. Faced with this conundrum of where does the profit come from, they can't take refuge in use values. Which leads him, therefore, to the following conclusion on 262. If commodities or commodities and money have equal exchange value and consequently equivalents are exchanged, it is plain that no one abstracts more value from circulation than he throws into it. The formation of surplus value does not take place. In its pure form, the circulation process necessitates the exchange of equivalents. But in reality, processes do not take place in their pure form. Let us assume an exchange of non-equivalents. And he then goes through a, a series of cases. Let's suppose the seller is privileged for some reason. Sellers are privileged in some reason. But then when you examine people's roles, you find that as if the sellers are privileged, then as buyers they're underprivileged. So they're not going to get any net gain. The same thing applies if buyers are privileged for some reason then as sellers they're going to be losers, so there's no net gain. Which leads him on 264 to consider the issue of what he calls effectual demand, or what we now call effective demand. What he's dealing with here is one answer that was given to this conundrum by some economists, particularly Malthus, in his political economy, which is to say, well, there's a class of consumers somewhere or other whose duty it is to consume as much as they possibly can because they've got excess money. And that's where the extra demand is going to come from that's going to give you the delta M. And in particular, Malthus argued in the following way. There are three classes, in big classes in society. Workers, who cannot possibly be a source of effectual demand. Capitalists who are reinvesting their money, so they can't be a source of effectual demand. And then there's a bunch of parasites in society. Aristocrats and lords and parsons and all the rest of it, who sit around with loads of money, and their job is to consume to the hilt in order to stabilize this system. Now Malthus also suggested that in the absence of a consuming class domestically, you might also go for foreign trade. And Marx answers both of those questions in the negative by kind of saying, well, if there's a class of landlords out there somewhere, then at some point or other they're going to be brought within the system, and to the degree that they are 
actually using money, the money is going to come from here somewhere, so they're not going to be the answer. All of those hangers-on in the state apparatus get their money from somewhere, it comes from this circulation process, so it's being extracted, so whatever is being extracted is simply being brought back in. And then, then he uses the argument about tribute to Rome to say, well, you know, even if you exchange with foreigners and you, uh, you rip them off, then they rip you off in reverse, and so again there's no surplus value which is going to come out of, uh, of that. So the effective demand argument, the external source of effective demand does not work, in Marx's view, nor does the internal class of consumers work. I mean, one of the great paradoxes, of course, in, in Malthus's case was his political economy talked about the necessity of a class of consumers who consumed like crazy in order to keep the economy in equilibrium. At the same time as it talked about poor people who were poor because they were reproducing to such a point that there were not enough resources to go around and they were, you know, all of those kinds of problems. So, in a sense, when he wrote his political economy, Malthus had a completely different explanation of how the world worked than when he wrote his theory of population. And it's very interesting to just look at those two representations that Malthus came up with, but his, his recognition of the effectual demand problem was important, as I mentioned last time. Keynes took that up as being very critical and sort of said, well, actually, debt financing is going to be one of the ways we can, we can do this. But for Marx, that can't work. And then he goes through the final argument, which is, well, maybe the problem is we're looking at the thing in aggregate, so we just simply look at individuals. And if we look at individuals, what we see is, in a sense, yes indeed, there can be a lot of robbing Peter to pay Paul, but there's no aggregate surplus value available in society that way. One person's loss is somebody else's gain, but then it quickly gets reversed, so there's no aggregate benefit that comes from that. Which leads into the conclusion on 266, however much we twist and turn, the final conclusion remains the same. If equivalents are exchanged, no surplus value results, and if non-equivalents are exchanged, we still have no surplus value. Circulation or the exchange of commodities creates no value. Very important proposition in Marx and something you really have to think about. Circulation creates no value. Value cannot be created by market exchange. It can be redistributed through market exchange, but it cannot be created through market exchange if the market exchange is of this perfect competition sort. Which leads him then to say, well, okay, we also have to deal with merchants' capital and usurers' capital. And he says, yes, okay, merchants' capital was one of the antediluvian forms of capital back in the early 16th century, 17th century. And merchants' capital was indeed based on violating the raw laws of exchange. 267, he quotes Franklin, war is robbery, commerce is cheating. So yes, merchants cheated the much of the world of value. They stole it, predatory practices and all the rest of it. But that is a violation of the laws of market exchange as envisaged by the classical political economists. The same applies to usurer's capital. But both and, and usurer's capital poses the problem of Aristotle's distinction between economics, which for Aristotle was about use values, it's interesting, it's about use values. Uh, what Aristotle talked about as crematistics <coughs> was about money making, and money making was, was, was as I suggested, filthy, bad, all the rest of it. Economics was good, because it's about exchange of use values. And so there's a critique of interest in here. 
But then Marx says something interesting. In the course of our investigation, we shall find that both merchants' capital and interest-bearing capital are derivative forms, and at the same time it will become clear why historically these two forms appear before the modern primary form of capital. What he's leaning to here is the, uh, this following idea. But capitalism had to get going somehow. And from the 16th century onwards, merchants' capital and usurers' capital played a crucial role in the dissolution of pre-capitalist forms of power, notably feudalism in Europe, some putative state forms elsewhere. The usurers lent to the landed nobility, and then the landed nobility couldn't pay them back, and landed nobility lost their lands. Merchants who couldn't make money internally within a country went outside, robbed the rest of the world of use values, came back, made lots of money, used that money power to start to de develop political power, which allowed them at some point or other to confront and destroy the power of landed property. So there's a historical story to be told about the origins of capitalism, which Marx is alluding to, and that historical story has a very powerful and important role assigned to it by merchants' capital and usurers' capital. But at some point or other, the modern industrial form of capital takes over. And the industrial form of capital needs merchants and needs an interest system. But that system has to be disciplined to the needs of industrial capital. So what Marx is talking about is a transformation in the role of merchants' capital and usurers' capital from something which is undisciplined, out there, doing all kinds of outrageous things, which are non-permissible in terms of the rules of the market, but being corralled and brought back into the capitalist system, disciplined to the requirements of industrial capital. The historical distinction which is made between usury and interest, for example. What was Martin Luther about? Nailing to the wall kind of theses and so on, saying interest is a fair rate of return on capital. Usury was abhorred. And as we know, it is still the case that interest is not consistent with Islamic law. But what we frequently don't know is that the Catholic Church had a ban on interest up until the 1840s, 1850s. Uh, even to the 1860s. And interest, taking of interest, was associated, with, directly so, with forms of prostitution. In 19th century France, for example, that was a very common way for right-wing Catholics to talk about it. There's some wonderful cartoon that I, I used in my Paris book, which is by a cartoonist called Gabarni in sort of some about mid-century, in which uh, this buxom lady is attempting to lure this old gent into an investment house. And she says to him, you can put down as much as you want, I'm sure your rate of return will be very good. Whatever you give me, I will make sure you get it back with interest." And the poor guy is shrieking away from this whole kind of thing. So this association of investment house with a brothel in, in 19th century France is very, very strong. So the whole kind of question of the role of interest in relationship to industrial capital is a problematic one. And it continues to be problematic, and we may want to think about this further today, because there is a question. To what degree is industrial capital in control right now? To what degree is interest-bearing capital, finance capital, in control? For many years in Britain, particularly in the post-war period, there was a contest between the interests of industrial capital in Britain and the City of London financial interests. And if the City of fin London financial interests were going to be served, that frequently harmed seriously the British industrial interest. 
and it was a Labour Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, back in around 1964-65, who made a key decision to favour the City of London over the industrial interest. And one of the results of that eventually was the deindustrialization of Britain. In the same way that the rise, rising power of financial interest in the United States has coincided with huge wave of deindustrialization inside of the United States. So the big question then is who, who has the power? But what Marx is dealing with is a situation where, as far as he was concerned, industrial capital was the key to understanding how surplus value was going to be produced, how it was going to circulate. And industrial capital, therefore, was the form of capital he was, going to, he was going to concentrate on, but he's here giving this historical role. So we come back on 268 to the final conundrum. We have shown that surplus value can arise from circulation, and therefore that for it to be formed something must take place in the background which is not visible, that's the occult side, okay, is not visible in the circulation itself. Bottom of page, capital cannot therefore arise from circulation, and it is equally impossible for it to arise apart from circulation. It must have its origin both in circulation and not in circulation. <coughs> the transformation of money into capital has to be developed on the basis of the imminent laws of the exchange of commodities, that's the equality principle, in such a way that the starting point is the exchange of equivalents. The money owner who is as yet only a capitalist in larval form must buy his commodities at their value, sell them at their value, and yet at the end of the process withdraw more value from circulation than he threw into it at the beginning. His emergence as a butterfly must and yet must not take place in the sphere of, sphere of circulation. These are the conditions of the problem. Hic rotus, hic salta. Here is the ball, now you run with it. So that's the conundrum to be solved and looked at in the next chapter. So let's, let's look at the, the sale and purchase of labour power. And having posed the rhetorical question at the end of the last chapter, kind of saying, where, where on earth does this surplus value come from? He immediately says, well, there's, a, there's an immediate answer and we'll just go straight to it. In order to extract value out of the consumption of a commodity, our friend the money owner must be lucky enough to find within the sphere of circulation, on the market, a commodity whose use value possesses the peculiar property of being a source of value, whose actual consumption is therefore itself an objectification of labour, hence a creation of value. The possessor of money does find such a special commodity on the market, the capacity for labour, in other words, labour power. Now Marx is going to make a big distinction between labour and labour power. Labour power is the, create, is the capacity to create value. And of course we know that value is socially necessary labour time. And the important idea here is that the capitalist must, must find a commodity, and in particular the commodity labour power, which can be bought and sold in such a way as to make absolutely sure that the labour power which is given to the capitalist is greater than the labour which is required to reproduce the labourer. And that's the calculus we're going to get into. Now one of the big consequences of this is that Marx is going to make an analysis of capitalism that does not involve in any way cheating in the world of exchange. All commodities in this analysis are going to exchange at their value. 
there is no violation of the equivalency requirement. Now this is something that some people kind of find a bit strange about Marx. You would have thought Marx would have said, oh, those people violating exchange, you know, power relations, this kind of thing. But here we come back to, I think, one of Marx's central missions, which is to undermine classical political economy. And classical political economy, as I've suggested, perpetually spun the story that if the world was made out of perfectly functioning markets, then everybody would be better off. And perfectly functioning markets assume equivalence in exchange. So Marx says, OK, I assume equivalency in exchange also. Now does this mean he believes that that's how capitalism is? No, not necessarily at all. So here he's beginning to look at the whole kind of relationship between classical political economy and the realities on the ground, and he's firmly going after classical political economy rather than trying to describe the realities on the ground. Let us suppose a perfectly functioning market economy. And he says, we mean by labour power or labour capacity, the aggregate of those mental and physical capabilities existing in the physical form, the living personality of a human being. Capabilities which he sets in motion whenever he produces a use value of any kind. But various conditions must be met. If labour power is going to become a commodity. The first condition is that the labourer must be, as he says on 271, the free proprietor of his own labour capacity, hence of his person. He and the owner of money meet in the market and enter into relations with each other on a footing of equality as owners of commodities, with the sole difference that one is a buyer, the other a seller. Both are therefore equal in the eyes of the law. So again we assume the law is going to be good in all of this, which it ain't necessarily so, but Marx is going to assume it. So the proprietor of labour power, that is the labourer, must always sell it for a limited period only. He hands it over to the buyer for the buyer to consume for a definite period of time, temporarily. In this way he manages both to alienate his labour power and to avoid renouncing his rights of ownership over it. The second essential condition, 272, is this, that the possessor of labour power, instead of being able to sell commodities in which his labour has been objectified, must rather be compelled to offer for sale as a commodity that very labour power which exists only in his living body. This is Marx's version of biopolitics. For the transformation of money into capital, therefore, the owner of money must find the free worker available on the commodity market, and this worker must be free in the double sense that as a free individual he can dispose of his labour power as his own commodity. And that, on the other hand, he has no other commodity for sale. He is rid of them, he is free of all the objects needed for the realization of his labour power. Now, this is an interesting riff on the notion of freedom. The labourer is free in the double sense free to sell his or her labour power to whomsoever, under any conditions of contract, always in control of their own body as a labourer, a proprietor over their own body. We're not dealing with slavery here, even though of course slavery continues to exist, but Marx is talking about the free labourer. But they're also freed of any control over the means of production. So they're freed in that double sense. So every time I hear George Bush talk about how he's going to deliver freedom unto the world, 
I think, yes, this is what he's about. He's going to free everybody of any control over the means of production. At the same time as he's going to turn them into individual proprietors and wage labourers. So next time you hear this mission about bringing freedom to the rest of the world, then remember what Marx's definition of freedom is under capitalism. And then when you actually look at politics on the ground under the Bush regime, you've got a pretty good idea that indeed this Marxian definition is pretty much what it's about. It's hardly an accident that coalition provisional authority in, in Iraq, about a year after the occupation, actually enforced a whole free labour regime, rights, all this kind of stuff, on the Iraqi as, Iraq as part of central part of the Iraqi constitution. At the same time, as they were saying that there should be no barriers to foreign ownership and no barriers to, to uh, uh, finance capital, no barriers to anything, you know, they were freeing they were freeing up the territory for uh, relieving people of any kind of concern about having control over the means of production. Now this then brings us, to the, of course, to the historical question. Why this free worker confronts him in the sphere of circulation is a question which does not interest the owner of money. For he finds the labour market in existence as a particular branch of the commodity market. This is where we recognise that there's been a historical process and Marx goes on to say, and for the present it interests us just as little, we confine ourselves to the fact theoretically, as he does practically. Then he throws in an immediate qualification, one thing is clear, nature does not produce on the one hand owners of money or commodities, and on the other hand men possessing nothing but their own labour power. This relation has no basis in natural history, nor, it, nor does it have a social basis common to all periods of human history. It is clearly the result of a past historical development, the product of many economic revolutions, of the extinction of a whole series of older formations of social production. And then he goes on to say, and the economic categories have undergone a similar revolution. But what we understood by labour under feudalism is something very different from what we understand by labour under capitalism. What we understood as commodities. And at the bottom here he makes, a, I think, a very important argument, which is important to, to note, towards the bottom of 273, the appearance of products as commodities requires a level of development of the division of labour within society such that the separation of use value from exchange value the separation which first begins with barter has already been completed, but such a degree of development is common to many economic formations of society with the most diverse historical characteristics. Not all market societies are capitalist societies. You can have sophisticated market systems, commodity exchange systems, which are non-capitalistic. He then goes on to say, well, on the next page, that all of these other forms were precursors, if you like, so he says on 274, the historical conditions of its existence, that is capital, capital's existence, are by no means given with the mere circulation of money and commodities. It arises only when the owner of the means of production and subsistence finds the free worker available on the market, as the seller of his own labour power, and this one historical precondition comprises a world's history. Capital, therefore, announces from the outset a new epoch in the process of social production. What's involved here is that capital could, be not ca could not be capital, 
without there having been a whole process of wage labour creation, proletarianization, which preceded it. So it's not simply money and commodities in these sophisticated forms that is necessary. Yes, they are necessary. But the other element that is necessary, which comprises a world's history, is the creation of a proletariat. The creation of a wage labour force which is selling its labour power as a commodity. So again there is this historical element which enters in. And we'll see that entering in in a different way too. The big question that then arises is what constitutes the value of labour power? And in the next series of passages he says, well, the worker needs subsistence, needs to live. So you have to provide enough commodities to allow the worker to live. But that then immediately poses the problem, how many commodities does the worker need to live? Part of that has to do with the nature of the labour, which you are demanding of the worker. You work them very hard, you've got to feed them better. As he says, definite quantities of human muscle, nerve, brain have to be replaced. Since more is expended, more must be received. His means of subsistence must therefore be sufficient to maintain him in his normal state as a working individual. Now, normal state, what is a normal state? His natural needs vary according to the climatic and other phys physical peculiarities of his country. On the other hand, the number and extent of his so-called necessary requirements, as also the manner in which they are satisfied, are themselves products of history and depend therefore to a great extent on the level of civilization attained by a country. In particular they depend on the conditions in which, and consequently on the habits and expectations with which the class of free workers has been formed. In contrast therefore with the case of other commodities, the determination of the value of labour power contains a historical and moral element. Nevertheless, in a given country at a given period, the average amount of the means of subsistence necessary for the worker is a known datum. The value of labour power is not simply a physical quantity dependent upon the degree of civilization in a country, it's de dependent upon the dynamics of class struggle. It depends on what people have got used to, it depends on climate, it depends on the nature of the labour. In other words, when we come to say what is the value of labour power, what is the value of a worker's labour power, we have to recognise this as a determination that comes from multiple sources. And it's obviously a very complicated history. And it varies greatly from place to place, and from time to time. But, he then goes on to say, in a given situation we know what that value is. Now it's interesting when you look at contemporary society, we have various ways in which we start to set that datum. There is something, for example, called the poverty level in this country. What does it take to feed, house, clothe, reproduce a family of four? I don't know what the contemporary figure is, anyone know? 17, 18,000, something like that a year? Something like that. 18 and change currently, thanks. So in a sense you could say, well, in this society 
we sort of got some datum there about in this society, it's that. Now, if, if you were in Ecuador, what would the poverty level be in Ecuador? What would it be in contemporary Argentina? What would it be in contemporary China? Clearly it's very different in different places. So Marx is accepting, yes, it's going to vary all over the place. And when class struggle gets hold of it, yeah, the, the, the definition of what is the value of labour power starts to change. And when the bourgeoisie starts to feel guilty, and decide they want to live in a civilized country where there's not poverty on their doorsteps all the time, they may say, well, maybe we should raise everybody up to a certain level of civilized level. So there are all kinds of forces at work in the determination of the value of labour power. But what Marx is going to do is to recognize that and then say, but for, given, for our purposes of analysis, I'm going to assume it's known. And just make that assumption and say, we know what the datum is. <coughs> and the datum is further flexible because you also have to incorporate in here some accounting for reproduction costs. Because you're not simply feeding the labourer at night so that they can come back the next morning, you've got to think about, you know, kids reproduction of the working class. You've also got to think too about the qualities of the labour power, the skills, how much you're going to spend on skills, this kind of stuff, what's the value of, of skills and so on. So what we're coming up with here is a movable datum which nevertheless we're going to have to say for purposes of analysis, we know what it is. But we see straight away that labour power is not a commodity like any other commodity. Because a moral, civilizational, class struggle element enters in. Now there may be other commodities where that happens too. But in the case of labour, all of that is up front and fundamental to what determines the value of labour power, and therefore you have to look at it in those terms. Furthermore, there's another peculiarity about labour power as a commodity. The capitalist goes into the market and buys all of these commodities and then puts them to work. But in the case of labour power, the capitalist only pays the labourer after the work is done. So in effect, the labourer is advancing their labour to the capitalist, hoping to get paid at the end of the day. And in China, as we know, about, I don't know, 30% of the labour force in some parts of the country don't even get their wages. So they advance their labour and they don't get their wages at the end of the day. And of course, declaring bankruptcy is one of the ways in which you can get away with that in this country too. So there are all kinds of peculiarities in this commodity. So when we start to talk about the commodity labour power, we have to acknowledge its peculiarities. Now, what is it that went into? the value of labour power. And here I think the best way to look at this is, what Marx is arguing is in effect how the original poverty level was defined in this country by Molly Orshansky, I think it was back in 1965 or something like that, when they first set up the definition of the po poverty level. And the way it was set up was this, they asked the question, what is the market basket of commodities which a family needs to survive? How much do they need to pay on housing? How much on clothing? How much on food? How much on transportation? And you add up the value of all of those commodities, and the aggregate value of all of those commodities 
when prorated over the year, gave you the poverty level. In other words, it was a particular market basket of necessary commodities at a given standard of living at a given time. Now, it's interesting to go back and look at the history of arguments over what should be in that market basket of commodities. Back in 1965 it did not include cell phones. Does it include that now? Should it include it? You know, some items have fallen out, some have entered in. And of course what the conservative right does is to say, you chose the wrong market basket, and they find a, a market basket which gives you a poverty level of 16,000, and if you're of the left you make it so that it comes to 20,000. But it's a social determination. Nevertheless, it's based on the value of the commodities which the labourer needs to survive. In other words, you pin the definition of the poverty level and the minimum wage and all the rest of it, or living wage, even the idea of a living wage, for example, is about what is it that you need to survive? What is the market basket of commodities you need to survive in today's world in the United States? And that's what you use. So the value of labour power is fixed by the value of the commodities which are necessary to reproduce the labourer at a given standard of living, at a given moment, in a given place. That's how the value of labour power is determined. And that value is fixed in a given place at a given time. And you can see also how it is sensitive to the changing value of commodities. For example, if necessities suddenly decrease in value, then the value of labour power declines. They still get the same bundle of, of goods, but the goods are much cheaper because the industries producing them have become much more productive. One of the reasons why you can keep labour costs down in this country is, of course, because Walmart is exploiting the hell out of China. So the market basket is much cheaper than it otherwise would be if you didn't have cheap imported commodities. It's one of the reasons why you know all this stuff about you know putting you know protectionism and so on is a really is really problematic because if you really sort of force the Chinese to up all those prices by revaluing, or you started to put tariffs and that on Chinese products, suddenly you find the value of all those goods would, would increase and you'd have to pay workers more in order to keep them at their standard of living to which they're accustomed. So what this means then is that the value of labour power is fixed in the marketplace by processes of by these processes of configuration of what the value of labour power is in terms of the value of the commodities used. Now there's an interesting element here. What kind of circulation process is the labourer in? They're in the CMC circuit. They start with this commodity labour power. So they're going to trade to the capitalist. They're given money. And they're given the amount of money needed to buy that bundle of commodities which allows them to reproduce themselves and their kids, reproduce the working class, so that they are continually there. Free as, uh, free as always. Interesting dynamic here. Labourers in the CMC, capital in the MCM. And that distinction is going to be very important to, I think, understanding 
the result of this conundrum which we've been looking at. So he says, on 279, the use value which the former gets, because in effect what the capitalist does is to buy the use value of labour power. So the use value which the capitalist gets in exchange manifests itself only in the actual utilization, in the process of the consumption of the labour power. That is, the capitalist is going to use the labour power in production. The consumption of labour power is completed, as in the case of every other commodity, outside the market or the sphere of circulation. So, says Marx, let us therefore, in company with the owner of money and the owner of labour power, leave this noisy sphere, where everything takes place on the surface and in full view of everyone, and follow them into the hidden abode of production, on whose threshold there hangs the notice, no admittance except on business. Here we shall see not only how capital produces, but how capital is itself produced. And who produces it? The secret of profit-making must at last be laid bare. But in order to understand this we have to get out of the sphere of circulation. So he says, we have to get out of this and depart from a very Eden of the innate rights of man, it is the exclusive realm of freedom, equality, property and Bentham. And then goes on and talks about the way in which freedom, because both buyer and a seller of commodity, are determined only by their own free will. They contract as free persons who are equal before the law. Equality, because each enters into relation with each other, as with a simple owner of commodities, and they exchange equivalent for equivalent. Property, because each disposes only of what is his own. And Bentham, because each looks only to his own advantage. And here we get the Adam Smith view again. The only thing that brings them together and putting them into relation with each other is the selfishness, the gain and the private interest of each. Each pays heed to himself only, and no one worries about the others. And precisely for that reason, either in accordance with the pre-established harmony of things, or under the auspices of an omniscient providence, they all work together, to their mutual advantage, for the common weal and in the common interest. Marx is being a little ironic. When we leave this sphere of simple circulation, or the exchange of commodities, which provides the free trade of Vulgaris with his views, his concept and the standard by which he judges the society of capital and wage labour, a certain change takes place. He who was previously the money, money owner now strides out in front as a capitalist. The possessor of labour power follows as his worker. The one smirks self-importantly is intent on business, the other is timid and holds back, like someone who has brought his own hide to market and now has nothing else to expect but a tanning. Interesting point here. This notion of rights and freedom. What Marx is actually doing here is, is in a way, pointing out that bourgeois constitutionality is entirely concerned with market relations. And that definitions of freedom and rights pertain there. But bourgeois constitutionality has almost nothing to say about what goes on inside of production. What goes on inside of a factory. And when states start to interfere with what goes on inside of the factory by passing legislation like OSHA, capitalists get outraged. It is a violation of the rights of private property. You don't want anybody prying around inside of the production process. 
and bourgeois constitutionality has nothing to say about what goes on inside the production process, nothing to say about it whatsoever. Yes, you can try and take some of these market relations and bring them back into and apply them to this world of production, but that's very hard to do. And this, I think, is a fascinating kind of point. Because a lot of politics right now is precisely about freedom and rights, perfectly consistent with the bourgeois vision of the world. And Marx is kind of saying, yeah, you can have a great time there, playing around with Bentham and notions of freedom and rights and all this kind of stuff, and private property and all the rest of it. I mean, this is the neoliberal ethic. Run wild. It's the liberal theory, run wild. Liberal constitutionality. And whenever, a, whenever a revolutionary movement comes in, like happened in Portugal in the 1970s, and they tried to set up a constitution which actually tried to legislate how production was to be organized, the bourgeoisie went utterly crazy. That is something you cannot and must not do. And what is interesting to me is to think how much of politics over the last thirty years has actually forgotten that. How much of politics, by going into abstract notions of human rights and freedom and rights and all this kind of stuff, is actually talking about something which is outside of what is going on in the actual production process itself. Because what Marx is saying is, you can't, you can't find the secret of how capital is produced by simply looking at the market. You can see that there is a commodity there, called labour power, which clearly has the capacity to produce more value than it itself has, but in order to crack the secret of profit-making and the production of capital, you have to go inside the production process, you have to go inside the labour process, and look at what is happening inside the factory. Look at what's happening in the labour process on the production line, in the fields, agribusiness, in the mines, <coughs> in the factories, in all those huge complexes in China, employing thousands and thousands of people, making socks and all the rest of it, things we wear. So that's where we have to go. And unless we're prepared to go into that realm, we're never going to find the real profit, the real secret of how profit is made. But in order to get to that point, we have to understand that a proletariat has to exist. Proletarianization has to have occurred. And again, Marx is saying, look, I'm not going to be talking here about how the proletariat was formed. Actually, he does in Capital talk about that, but it's in part eight, where he deals with the formation of the, of the proletariat and primitive accumulation. But here he's saying, I'm assuming there's a labour market, proletariat's already in place, wage labour is everywhere, the value of labour power is known. All those datums, if, datas, if you like, are known. We then go on to construct a theory on the basis of that form of argument. Now again, there are, are assumptions built into this. He's clearly taking on, here and everywhere else, the theses of liberalism, and the theses of classical political economy. And he's taking them at their word. But he then wants to show when you take them at their word, you can't solve the secret of profit-making unless you do something else which is 
part three, which is going to be about the production of surplus value, of absolute surplus value. <laughs> so what we'll do next time is to read the next three chapters, paying particular attention to the first ten pages or so of chapter seven on the labour process. So we have some time for general discussion on what's gone on in these three chapters. Anybody want to raise questions? Yeah. Uh, you could you could you could make that argument, but then um, that will then depend on a historical, you know, on the historical events that actually happened. We'll see some of that being depicted in Capital. Now, Marx's account of that is that the formation of a proletariat really began to form in the sort of 14th. 13th, 14th centuries, and that was a long, long process. So you get elements of a wage labor system uh, which are arising when there's no industrial capital around. There is certainly, at some point, an agrarian capital which begins to kick in and start to proletarianize in the, country, in the countryside, wage labor, conversion of peasants into wage laborers in the countryside through the enclosure movement. So you start to see elements of this. So yes, you could argue that there is a co-evolution of the rise of the proletariat and the rise of a capitalist class, but the way Marx depicts it is that many elements of proletarianization preceded the rise of, as it were, the industrial form of capital, which is going to be fundamentally concerned with the exploitation of labor power and production at the end of the 18th century. By then, an extensive proletariat was already in place, function, functioning in all kinds of ways, including, by the way, and this is a very important element in, in the British case, as, as a servant class, which is a, which is a class of wage labourers employed as, as menial servants and, and, and you know, coachmen and all that kind of stuff uh, for, for a fairly affluent consuming class. So there was a class of wage labourers that was spread eagled around, uh, and then already, already in place before industrial capitalism could seize upon that and start to use it. So in a sense, uh, this, was the, this was more the egg and the chicken is, is, the, is the industrialization that occurred uh, a bit later. But uh, in order for wage labor to occur, there had to be kind of wage labor relations established in the countryside, established in the service sector and all the rest of it. And the service sector in Britain, for example, was very large, and a lot of it was indeed straight wage labor. So that, pro that was, and, and that was not a capitalist relation. That was a sort of master-servant kind of kind of relation. Yeah. The, the notion of human rights as we know it today is much. I mean, it didn't exist at the time that Marx was writing. But I'm just curious because you said something very quickly, and I was trying to understand when you're talking about notions of rights and freedoms being something that had to be, had to address or be involved inside what the means of production and the production process. One of the more marginalized areas of human rights today is economic, social, and cultural rights, which I, as I was reading the, 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 how he defined the actual value of labor power is what it, I mean, economic and social rights is about the right to adequate housing, the right to, it's, it's a struggle to define and to challenge those notions. So I was trying to understand if you were suggesting or that Marx or you yourself that all notions, are, is it, are we, do we already begin with, I mean obviously it's, it's problematic, right? I mean we're trying to define things within the system but without, were you saying that human rights, all human rights as we just define them now, <coughs> does not try to challenge the actual system itself, that it's actually just a reflection of the bourgeoisie 
It depends. It depends. What we're talking about here is, is of course, one of the ways in which class struggle unfolds is over the rights of labour to a decent wage, a living wage, rights to housing or medical care and all the rest of it. So there are struggles in the market, which are very important struggles to be waged, which play a very crucial role in determining the value of labour power and therefore, from the standpoint of the proletariat, are very important struggles. Okay. That's very different, however, from rights and powers which arise uh, for labour in the production process. Now, there's a good deal of evidence that the, the labour reforms that came through, I mean, the National Labour Relations Board, which was set up in the 1930s, paralleled the setting up of legislation which empowered unions towards collective bargaining strategies which allowed them to improve their, their positionality in the market. And there was a trade-off being offered between empowering people in the market and, and disempowering them in the production process. In the 1920s and 1930s, one of the ways in which workers insisted on empowerment in the, in the production process was through definition of skills. And if you look at the number of skilled uh, categories that existed in something like the steel industry in the 1920s, it was, it was huge. And it meant a worker in a particular skilled category could, could not be displaced by another worker in another skilled category. In other words, there was a good deal of worker monopoly power inside of the production process. What the National Labor Relations Board did was to start to dismantle some of that through a process of external adjudication over skill disputes within production, for example. And what this led to in the long run was a gradual disempowerment of workers at the point of production, as opposed to their empowerment in the market. So in a sense what happened was a legislative move which was deliberately about get, you know, let, let workers be treated as ever, however you want at the point of production. Empower them in the market. Because in the 1930s that was very important anyway because of the con you know, effective demand problem. So the point here is not to say that struggles over rights uh, over wages and over health care and all that kind of thing are irrelevant, but to say they are fundamentally different from struggles over rights at the point of production. And that disempowerment of workers at the point of production is really an issue. I mean, we saw that, for example, in the la that, that mining tragedy in Idaho, in Idaho, you know. I mean, people might be getting a decent wage and they may be getting good health care and so on, but if you die down the pit because they haven't done anything about the production process in the pit and they're not going to do anything about it because it costs too much, then you're in a different world. And I think what Marx is doing here is to point out that there are two different arenas and they're quite different from each other, and if you concentrate only on one, to the detriment of the other, you're going to be looking at the one which the bourgeoisie wants you to look at, where the bourgeoisie is perfectly happy to negotiate. Because it's within kind of the era of legality, and you can hire lawyers and all that kind of stuff, and of course it's great for the lawyers and all the rest of it. But then what Marx is kind of saying, empowerment at the point of production. I mean, for instance, the, the right of, 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 of agricultural labourers who, who are <coughs> working with all those pesticides uh, to know what pesticides they're working with and what the health consequences are of the of you know OSHA at one point tried to set up a system where it was mandatory for every major kind of industrial process to list the kinds of chemicals you were working with in in in, in the production process and say something about their qualities were they carcinogenic you know what kinds of health things could come from this etc 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 of course, that all disappeared with Reagan and, 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 and all the rest of it. But the point, the point here is that what goes on at the point of production is actually 
very vital for, for what happens to the worker and, and what happens to them on, on the production line. What, you know, to, to what degree can they resist disciplinary actions on, on, on the production line? You know, is there harassment on the production line? What happens there? Those kinds of things. So this, it's a kind of complicated world. So what Marx is simply saying is that the field of rights is, is very much one that is, is familiar to the bourgeoisie and therefore we talk about that a lot and some of that is very important obviously in terms of determining the value of labour power and the conditions of labour and so on, but we have to look at another peer, uh, field which is empowerment at the point of production. And th the language of rights is very hard to apply at that point. It's about power relations and about knowledge and information and all kinds of things of that kind. So it's hard to articulate it in terms of the simple language of rights and so that to, to the degree that NGOs and all the rest of it concentrate on a language of rights, they're actually concentrating on a language of uh, bourgeois discourse which, you know, where progressive things can happen. But you're still limiting yourself by not looking at what's going on in terms of the production process. And that's where Marx says we've got to also look. We've got to look at both of these arenas uh, together. Okay, we're a bit over time. The temporality, law <laughs> steps in, socially necessary labour time is over, so we'll see you next week. <laughs>